Hello, everybody. Clap your hands. Oh, oh, I'm looking good. You gonna sing my song? We won't take long. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the best of the 757 Community Talk Show. I know I'm running a little late, but I got my guests here. And Chris Lewis is joining the live broadcast. Let's uh, be followers now. Okay. Hello. Hey, hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Let me turn this up a little bit. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you, but... Um... It's kind of low, but we're going to make it kind of low on your end. Huh? Can you turn yours up a little? Yeah, mine is up as high as it'll go. It Let is? Just check a couple of other things. Hold tight, hold tight. Oh, mm. let's see. Well, I mean, I can hear you, but it's not so loud, but uh, okay, it is I what it is. We'll, we'll, work, we'll work with what I got. How you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Out here at but, West Point Cemetery and... Ready to, that's um, good. That's good. I don't know what's going on with the uh, volume. Um, it's, can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. It's just low. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's low, but I got it all the way up. I don't. I don't. I don't know what's going on with the uh, with Facebook lately. I haven't used it in a minute. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. There it goes. Came up a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Cecil said, I hear you. Oh, Cecil Jenkins, you know, protege of Marvin Gaye is watching. And thank he you said, you hear us very well. Okay, thank you so much for that. You know, so, you know, uh, Mocha Steph, uh, she's an entrepreneur and she's a historian of the 757. Let me show your book a little bit. You know, I, I got to yes. put it so, so people can see, you know, your calendar and those mm -hmm. that want to purchase it, you know, you can tell them about it. And uh, let them know about what, where you at and why you somewhere out in 757 strolling through the, you know, strolling through the scenery. Yes. Well, today I'm here on behalf of my company, Culture by LE, which is a product and service-based company that takes pride in honoring Virginia's Black ancestral legacy and heritage. We okay. um, also offer lots of content on the website, culturebyle.co, and social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also visit the souvenir shop online at culturebyle.co and purchase a unique gift. Uh, you uh, will be able to book speaking engagements soon. And today we're here at West Point Cemetery, which is a very monumental and historic cemetery. Mm -hmm. It was founded by uh, James E. Fuller, who was Norfolk's first black councilman back in 1886. Wow. I'm going to turn, turn the camera around because if you're interested in coming out at any point, it may mm -hmm. seem complicated. Can I turn this camera around? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll just leave it like this. Okay. It may seem complicated to get in because there's work being done on Princess Anne Road. But if you make your way to the cemetery from Church Street and then come up towards Monticello, there's an entrance right before the road work that you can come into to get mm -hmm. into the cemetery. Now, once you come into the cemetery, it may be like a maze because there's a lot of different sections. And some of the streets for getting into the cemetery are kind of faded. But just keep in mind to make your way to the back of the cemetery where this brick wall is. If you can see, because I know that the sun is real bright out here, yeah. but uh, make your way towards the back where the brick wall is. And then you'll know you're in the right spot once you come across the information that pertains to James E. Fuller. Oh, okay. Man, that's, that's exciting to know. Uh that we have such historical places. And where's that located at again? Uh, Norfolk. West Point Cemetery is located in Norfolk off of Princess Anne Road. Oh, okay. And um, if you're familiar with the Monticello uh, Road area, there's a side street right behind the 7-Eleven and uh, rallies called Armstead Street. And once you come down Armstead Street, 
you'll see a tall monument that we're going to visit in a little bit. And that's mm -hmm. a monument of one of our Black Civil War soldiers by the name of Sergeant William H. Carney. He was a, a sergeant in the 54th Massachusetts in Infantry, and mm -hmm. those soldiers fought for our freedom during the Civil War. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and read some information about James E. Fuller. I'm going mm -hmm. to turn my phone around so that you can see the picture because, oh, wait a minute, here he is right here. Mm hmm Okay, yay! Okay, I was able to turn the camera around. Yeah, okay, so yeah. let me go back to the wall. Let me go back. Let me go back. Because okay, I was like, hold yeah, up, wait a minute. Go okay. back to the wall. Okay, so yes, I'm going to show you these streets too, because some of the streets are paved pretty good, but then mm -hmm. some of the streets are like sand or dirt roads. So as you're coming into the cemetery, you'll see that some of the streets are kind of fading in the pavement. But just keep in mind to continue to stroll towards the back of the cemetery. And you can see this wall clearer now because the sun is not in the way. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, just uh, use the wall as a landmark. And uh, we're walking up on the information now. You see the flag and the sign that lets us know that we're in the section so that we can see the black soldiers and pay homage and respect to them. And now, here's the information that pertains to James E. Fuller, Norfolk's first black counselor. All right, here we go. Let me catch my breath because that was a lot of walking. <laughs> okay, so James E. Fuller, 1844 through 1809. The monument was largely the work of James E. Fuller, a slave and quartermaster in the United States Colored Cavalry during the Civil War. After the war, Fuller served Norfolk County, Virginia in several capacities, served on the advisory board, the Freedmen's Bank, was a member of the Common Council, and instrumental in starting Samuel M. Armstrong School, the first public school built for Blacks in 1886. He petitioned, uh, he petitioned the Select Council to set aside Section 20 of West Point Cemetery. Uh, the, this is all part of uh, Elmwood Cemetery, mm -hmm. to bury members of the Norfolk Union Organization and Negro Union Veterans. On March 2nd, 1886, his resolution was adopted by the Common Council and the Select Council on April 13, 1886. As president of the Norfolk Memorial Association, Fuller led citizens in their efforts for a monument to mark the plot. They raised money through sales, raffles, concerts, and other fundraising efforts. Mm -hmm. Enough funds were raised to erect the monument altar, which was dedicated on May 20th, 1906, to record the shaft. In 1920, the Norfolk Memorial so Association erected the monument. It was designated in uh, memory of heroes, 1861 through 1865. And so I'm gonna move back so that you could see all of what I've read. And again, get a close up of Councilman Fuller, James mm -hmm. E. Fuller, Norfolk's first black councilman, 1886. Wow. And I'm gonna go here and read this information about the monument, additional information about the monument, which was dedicated in 1920 by Norfolk Memorial Association, the only monument in the South featuring an almost life-size Black Union soldier that reminds us of a tale too easily forgotten. Slavery, segregation, and efforts to win freedom. It stands proudly as a memorial to fallen heroes of our country's wars. And so yes, uh, yeah, this wind out here is a trip. My eyes are watering up and everything. Okay. And so, do you have any questions? Well, you know, is there a lot of uh, Afro Americans there that you know historically, or uh, um, uh, there's a grave site that we're going to visit uh, with uh, with Black Union soldiers, uh, soldiers from the Spanish American War, and mm -hmm. uh, other soldiers, Black soldiers, and things of that nature who are laid to rest right behind the monument of Sergeant Connie. And then over off over to another side of the cemetery, there's a uh, section for the Fuller family. Uh, James E. Fuller, his wife, and a couple of other members are buried off to another section, buried off in another section of the uh, grave site or the cemetery. 
So how how often do uh, uh, if if you if you have any information, how often do the school take students to this place um, to let them know about the historical value um, and the contribution that Afro Americans made to the city of Norfolk and to the seven five seven? Well, to my knowledge, it's not happening at all, and that's got to change. And you know, okay. I'd like to be a part of making that happen. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, you know, that's important to know. I mean, we have to, you know, like I'm saying, we have to learn how to get behind us and support, you know, causes that uh, that's going to enlighten our young people, so they can be more aware of their historical value. But we can we can show bullying and violence every day in the on on television, and 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 they're not demonstrating this type of uh, history and information. That that should be geared to the Afro American community. Exactly. I see you in DCP Black Power all day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm uh, that... this other person. Good afternoon. Good Tuesday, Kevin. Kevin, I hope I said your name right. Good Tuesday afternoon. Okay. All right. So this here is a monument of Sergeant William H. Carney dedicated mm -hmm. in his honor he was a soldier a sergeant in the 54th massachusetts uh regiment um his bravery is incredible he was fighting at fort wagner in 1863 if i'm not mistaken uh -huh. and what happened was you know he was fighting doing his thing in the war and uh the flag bearer had got shot down and he sustained bullet wounds. He got shot in the arm, leg, and in the chest. And in the midst of all of that bleeding, in the midst of his injury, he rushed to grab the flag so that it wouldn't touch the ground. And the flag during that po uh, point in time was very important. And so, you know, he continued to fight. Um, he continued to fight bravely and endlessly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at some point in time, he was taken to receive medical attention. And even when he was receiving that medical attention, he held that flag. He didn't let it go until it was handed to another member of his regime, the 54th Massachusetts. Wow. And um, one of his famous sayings when he came back, because, you know, once he recovered from his injuries and things of that nature, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he said, I only did my duty. And boys, the old flag never touched the ground. So that's right. something that we can hold on to. Because as we talk about our heritage, our history, and our culture, we know that we got some soldiers. We know that we got some heroes. And we, got, we know that we got some people who fought and died for us, for our freedom, mm -hmm. our liberties, for us to be able to sit up here and have this conversation that we're having today. Yeah. And, and that's, that's why it's so, you know, um, to try to bring that type of enlightenment to the best of the 757 community. Um, and you know, let our young people know they have a large, large um, history, and it's not all about slavery. It's about you know building this country. American mm -hmm. American history is Black America, is Black American history. You know, we built the country, you yes, know, we did. for free, four hundred years. You know, and and continue to uh, manifest and produce uh, products and services. Uh, that we still somehow don't get recognition for. And that's, I think most of the time, that's what, you know, get our young people not caring because they feel like, you know, don't nobody care. I mean, I've heard them say it, I've talked to them. Don't nobody care about us, you know? You know, so when that happens, when that type of uh, mentality comes about, it, it lacks the response, the response that our people uh, are, are perceiving uh, when holding conversation is that nobody cares about us. Because uh -huh. if, if, you, if you give people hope, then they have dreams. Right, right. And right now what I'm doing while you're talking, uh -huh. I'm getting a uh, image. I'm capturing the image of the grave sites of uh -huh. the soldiers of the Civil War, Spanish-American War, and other wars that mm -hmm. died who fought because no war has been won, no American war has been won without the black muscle, without I, the muscle of the black soldiers. 
I'm and these are our soldiers right here. Yeah, and I'm trying to tell them they don't, they ain't listening. You can't win a war without us. You go out there and fight <laughs> if you want them. You, you go go out there and fight if you want them. They send they they, they send a they send they send an aircraft to bring you home. <laughs> you know. So they they keep taking it for granted. You know, it, you know, we all fight in a war. But when it comes to the responsibility of the Afro-American, he gets less credit for doing anything that's that's positive. Mm -hmm. You know, right. we, our image is always showing that we get in high, we only know how to twerk, you know, we only know how to get drunk, blow a joint, you know. But when it comes to the real stuff, they don't want to they don't want to demonstrate that. They don't want to show that. Right. And, you know, as been depicted in some movies, we've seen how the black soldiers bailed out the white soldiers. They didn't want the black soldiers to fight, but they needed the black soldiers. Hello. That's that's in all wars. I mean, even when they was fighting the Indians, they, they said the Indian was scared because the because the uh, the black man had curly hair like the buffalo. I hope that I'm able to capture the close-ups because I want to get all of these to the stone so that we mm -hmm. can see. Yes, and then I'm going to make my way over mm. to the plaque okay. with additional information about the monument. Today we have, Connie, you know, Dr. as our Connie. guest, Mocha Steph. She's a historian, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she developed a Afro-American calendar and today she's out in uh, Norfolk, you know, uh, showing some of the historical grave sites of Afro-American because this is uh, Black History Month. And to let you know that right here in our local community in Norfolk, and give that location again for those that's just charming in would know where you are, uh, where this, uh, these memorials are, these, these grave sites are located. And this one is faded as we can see. Mm -hmm. But I still want to capture it. Is this all? This is this this all black cemetery, uh, dating back West from Point different? Cemetery. Huh? It's at West Point Cemetery, located in Norfolk, Virginia, okay. off of Princess Sand Road, between mm. Princess Sand Road and uh, excuse me, off of Princess Sand Road between Church Street and Monticello Avenue. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you know. Got a few more to visit. And this 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 grave this grave site the uh, burial ground it it covers uh, different wars or just one individual you know people that are buried there. So the man shout out to Teresa Riddick who's watching. Hello, Teresa. How you doing? You know, we 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 are. Black History Month. We are we are challenging people, and uh, uh, to let people know that we have historical places here in the seven five seven, and this is located in Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, she's yeah. going to different monuments of Afro Americans who fought in different wars uh, okay, to secure is. this to secure this country. Yes. Yeah. And so now we're going to make our way over to the monument. We're going to get another visual. Oh, let me get some information here, a little close-up. Again, mm -hmm. this monument was erected by Norfolk Memorial Association to the memory of our heroes, 1861 through 1865. And down below, there's some additional information. The whole section of the whole of section number 20 donated to the Union State of New Hall. Trying to see what this writing says. Union Veteran Hall Association by revolution proposed by Comrade James E. Fuller, adopted by the Common Council March 3rd, 1886, and by the Select Council April 18, 1886. Mm -hmm. So this is information about the bottom portion, which is the altar, the monument altar. Let's see. Uh, dedication March 30th, 1906 by Norfolk 
Memorial Association. And this writing is, you know, I can barely read most of it. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. And then below there are some founding members. And so let's see if I can zoom in on the founding members. I hope that y'all can see this. Okay, let's see. The founding members of Norfolk Memorial Association. James E. Fuller, president. Ms. Kathleen uh, Rice, president. It looks like uh, Mr. L. J. Wiley, board secretary. Uh, James P. Carter, president. Abel C. Carter, secretary. Magnus Reagan's secretary. James E. Fuller, custodian. So that just again that he facilitated all of this and then here's some information that's a lot more legible to read mm -hmm. pertains to Langston camp number one United States veteran war a war veteran and here's some additional information national camp number two United States uh, Spanish war veterans so it goes back to the Spanish War there with the soldiers there? Yes, this memorial is in recognition of the uh, Black veterans who fought and died during the Civil War and also the Spanish-American War. Mm. Okay. It now was in the Black soldiers were in all wars. Uh, and of course, we know that the Civil War and the Spanish-American War happened after the Revolutionary War. All right, let me see. Okay, so this is a plaque here with additional information about the West Point Monument. Norfolk Civil War, American, uh, African-American heritage. Can you see this clearly? I can see West Point, mon mon is it monument? Okay, let's see if I, okay, what about now? Can you see it? Yeah, sideways. Okay. Yeah. The other way you had so it was. Could... Yeah. I could see it like, yeah, we could see it clearly closer you get. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and read the information that's on the plaque. Uh -huh. The memorial before you, the West Point Monument, was built in 1909 as a tribute to African American veterans of the Civil War and Spanish American War. James Fuller, a former slave and veteran of the first United States Colored Cavalry, led the effort to erect the monument. Fuller was Norfolk's first African-American councilman, and he successfully lobbied for the establishment of this section of Elmwood Cemetery named West Point as a burial ground for Norfolk's African-American citizens. The cornerstone of the Soldiers Monument was laid by William Fuller, in 1908. However, the monument was not completed until 1920. When the monument was finally unveiled, it was the first memorial to African American soldiers in, Vir in Virginia. The Civil War soldier depicted on the West Point Monument is Norfolk Native Sergeant William H. Carney of the 54th Volunteer Regiment. I'm gonna stand back and get another picture. Uh -huh. of this. Ooh, this sun is blaring. Okay, that's a good one right there. I can see. Okay. While his parents were born, while his parents were born slaves, they secured their freedom and left Norfolk with their son for New Bedford, Massachusetts in 1855. Connie enlisted in the 54th Massachusetts in 1862. He fought with the regiment during the July 18, 1863 attack on Fort Wagner, South Carolina. When the color birds were shot down in the failed assault, Carney, despite being severely wounded, managed to save the U.S. flag from capture. When they saw me bringing the colors, Carney recollected, they cheered me on as I was able to tell them that the old flag never touched the ground. Connie was, award, was awarded the Medal of Honor for his extraordinary bravery under fire. Mm -hmm. He was the first of 16 African-American soldiers to receive the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. 
Sergeant Carney's stone figure sol solemnly stands today as a tribute to 100 African-American veterans at rest in West Point Cemetery. And let's see, here's some additional information about William Carney. And I'm gonna, wait, is it down here? Okay, let me see something. Okay, here it is right here. Carney was one of about 200,000 African-American soldiers and soldiers to serve the Union during the Civil War. The Union could not avoid using African-Americans to aid its war effort. Each form of slave serving with a weapon or as a laborer lessened the South's ability to maintain its economy and fight the larger federal army. Consequently, Congress passed the Militia Act of July 17, 1862, authorizing President Lincoln to organize African Americans for any for any military or naval service for which they may have been found competent. The act coupled with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation opened the door to African Americans not only seeking their freedom, but also to help release those still held in bondage. As for one former slave wrote, this was the biggest thing that ever happened in my life. I felt like a man with a uniform on and a gun in my hand. I felt freedom in my bones. So, yes, yes, this is our history here yeah. in Norfolk. And um, it's a wonderful way to show respect and honor the ancestors to come out and just soak up this moment because they fought for us. We yes. know now that there are people that fought for us. The Civil War wasn't just a bunch of white people fighting black. We got black soldiers that fought and died for us. Right. And this is a true representation of it. Right here in Norfolk, West Point Cemetery. Any questions? Uh, do, is it, do they have any um, uh, Afro-American females that might have, you know, not been in the military, but worked as, as part of the military out there? Well, that's starting to come to light. There was uh, one um, black female soldier by the name okay. of, uh, what's her name? Kathy, I can't remember her last name, but she's from Independence, Colorado. And mm -hmm. she actually disguised herself as a man. William oh. Kathy kept, which she went by uh, William Cathay, but her first oh. name was Kathy and I think her last name was Williamson. And okay. so that information came to my attention about a year ago and so oh. if she did it i'm pretty sure that other women did it as well so i uh, do you have an event coming up and yes would you like for the you know tell the people about the event that you know they're interested in supporting that yes most definitely um this saturday february 19th i'll be speaking at uh any river library from 1 to 2 p.m i'm going to post the link in this live uh, or after this live is completed, uh, you'd have to register for the event. The, the event is free and open to those who register and um, will be speaking on behalf of Virginia's Black Ancestral Legacy and Heritage, speaking of the history and the contributions of our ancestors, such as uh, Booker T. Washington, um, Henrietta Lacks, uh, Elizabeth P. Grinstead, uh, Sergeant William uh, H. Connie, James E. Fuller, Nat Turner, and a few other people, you got to come out and hear it. So go ahead on and register. Um, you can click on the live afterwards for the additional information. I'll also be including the links to uh, my social media pages and the website so that you can go back and read the content and also visit the online shop to purchase a unique gift. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, because this, the, the, the uh, calendar that you it, it put together is very nice. And that's something that, you know, parents should try to support uh, to get one of those for their kids. So, you know, you give the kids something to do to like look, research this person, uh, look them up, write a story. It gives the kids, you know, you can, ex you know, get the kids to explore and research and stuff that can help benefit, you know, keep them out, keep them in the house and not on the streets. Right. 
Right. Black history is every day, every yeah. month, not just limited to the month of February, but the month of February is special. And we should also take the opportunity to take part in celebrating Black History Month because, yeah. you know, as I said before, Black History is 366. We can't forget leap year. Yeah. And speaking of Black History Month, you know, sometimes people may mention, well, why is February the shortest month? Um, why is the shortest month of the year, February, delegated to Black History Month? Well, the founder of Black History Month is Carter G. Woodson, who's also a Virginia native. And yeah. he Black History Month began as Negro History Week back in 1926. Mm -hmm. And it was in honor or in tribute to Frederick Douglass and another person. Uh, the third week of February is when Black History Week was initially celebrated. Mm -hmm. And as we move later on into history, um, at California State University, there was a five month long protest because, you know, in, in colleges, uh, aside from HBCUs, there was no Black history. All of the history was Eurocentric. And the students there got tired, they wanted to know more. And so they had a five month long protest and then after that, Black history was incorporated into California State University. And in 1970, Kent State University began their uh, annual celebration of Black history. And so this is our month, every month is our month, and we don't have to limit ourselves to celebrating uh, just the 28 or 29 days of February. And, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, this I mean, that, calendar. yeah, the calendar, yeah. Virginia natives. That's what I'm talking about. Wind is blowing, but this is it. Yeah. You can get it at the online souvenir shop. Yes. Souvenir. I got mine. You know, people need to be <laughs> dead. You. you know, it's important, <laughs> you know, for us to support one another. We we are yes. we are constantly uh not not taking we take focus off things and you know, with all the violence going on every day, people shooting, fights breaking out in school now you know, they should be, you know, trying to come up with better ways of getting our young people attention until it's too late, you know, mm -hmm. and especially when they're not telling them, you can act up, but you wind up, you're going to jail. Once you get yeah. that rap sheet in school, it's right. going to follow you the rest of your life. Right. And we've talked about the uh, school to prison pipeline. Have you heard of the new thing with the school to prison pipeline where if a student does something as menial as kicking a trash can, they stand the possibility of getting a felony on their record? What? No, I ain't yeah. heard that one. Yeah. So uh -huh. is, that, is that in every city in, or in the state or just, you know, something that they just keep coming up with for black people? Well, I mean, it pertains to black people and I'm not sure if it's all across the country at this point. But um, yeah, in conversations that I've had with, you know, a few people that I know, uh -huh. it's been verified. Hmm. Yeah, we're gonna have to look into that one. I'm gonna have to bring that up with some people so they can uh, verify it a little bit more. Cause uh, stuff like that, I mean, with the, like I said, the pipeline of prison is real and that's industrialized. Like when they keep talking about, uh, we're gonna defund the police department. It's the same thing they said back in the 80s when they said, we're no longer going to keep people in prison. We can't afford it. We're going to turn them over to privatize industry. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why we have all the violence. That's why we have all this stuff going on, because they have to keep those prisons filled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a business. It's not mm -hmm. a luxury. It's not, you know, it's not going out and just chilling. Mm -hmm. You know, I got 10,000, some of those privatized prisons hold 10,000 or more people. Mm -hmm. And they get about anywhere from, I'll say, I'll say bare minimum, let's say 20,000 to $50,000 a, a prisoner. Wow. And they got to keep the, and if it's empty, the city or the state still got to, still got to pay them. Just like mm -hmm. you're going through the toll. See, everything, they turn it over to privatized. Mm -hmm. Once they privatize it, you have to pay what they say pay. Right. You know, right. so the government is really selling the country out to to, to corporations because they say, well, we can take care of better than you. That's what they're going to mm -hmm. do with the police department. 
you know, you're getting overweight. You don't want to do this. You're shooting people. You're scared. So let's do this. We're going to defund the police department, take that money, and put it in artificial intelligence because they ain't scared of nobody. No. How can artificial uh, artificial intelligence be afraid of anybody or anything? Right. <laughs> then, then, then what? When, then what the police department gonna do when when they when when the artificial intelligence is gonna come after you? Mm-hmm. And it's and, programmed to do so. Yeah. You ain't. You ain't. You you sitting home. You thinking, hey, I'm getting away with this. Artificial intelligence in the sky. They've been doing that ever since the internet. I had a video uh-huh. game called Spy. Yeah. Well, they got yeah. the Hubble satellite. That Hubble uh-huh. satellite can turn sideways. It stands straight up. It, it, it floats like this through space. It, they can maneuver it to turn straight up like this. You can be in New York City at 5 o'clock rush time, and they can find your car. <laughs> Read your right. license plate in traffic right. jam. So what are you right? All of this digital stuff is not a game, it's a test. Hello, right. the testing is over with. Because next year you'll be able to buy a flying car. <laughs> that, that's gonna fly three thousand, it'll fly, it'll it'll run down a highway, a road, and take right off, and it'll fly as high as three thousand feet. You know they got swimming cars too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, so when people sit around here thinking that it's a joke, it's a game. They coming out there, everybody. Right. And then what you going, you know, and they say, bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do when they come <laughs> for you? You used to be the bad boys. Then they coming <laughs> for you, too. So we got to get that money. That's what it's all about, the dollar. And the American yeah. dollar has no value. That's why the country is pipping out the citizens. That's well, why the country is pipping out the citizens, because it costs about 16 cents to make one penny. Right. But the United States got gold. They stopped Say trading what? gold. The United States is worth eight, nine hundred. They got nine hundred and seventy-eight trillion dollars in gold, mm. and they tell you they broke. Oh yeah. Because they don't. They don't trade and they don't use the gold no more for value. That's why it's when like- they start talking about all this money that they were giving away. If you watch the news, they say, well, how are you going to pay for it? How come it's going to pay for it? Well, what we can do is we can make this new coin. We can melt some gold and put silver with it. Mm-hmm. We, can, we, can, we can produce about $100 trillion in that and sell mm-hmm. let people buy that. And that will be the money that we will pay for different things now. Mm-hmm. People, Just like, the, uh... the country is not broke. No, because they got thirty million dollars to pay for crack pipe. Yeah, they ain't broke. I'm just trying to tell you. <laughs> and that's a whole other thing right there. Mm-hmm. How you gonna hold on? Let me say this right quick. Uh-huh. You know, how do these two people gonna sit up here back in the day in the '90s and call the people, primarily black people, super predators for selling crack and push laws to get them locked up? For longest sentences and selling crack uh, cocaine, and a lot of these people, or some of these people, are just getting out from doing twenty to thirty year bids. And yeah. These same people who were pushing the laws and calling them people super predators are pushing the crack pipe, but and they got thirty million dollars to make the crack pipe to make it accessible for people who are smoking crack. Hello. But they ain't got no money, and black people ain't got no reparations yet. Hello. But everybody- every, who else got who got reparations? Yeah, everybody but, but they us. ain't got no money. Everybody but us. The people that come in the country now, they just came from Afghanistan. They're getting two and three hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And, and who is it? Who's the country overseas? What is it? Israel? Uh-huh. They get money every year. And black people built this country. Free. Sweat and tears. But they don't want them to know. They don't want their kids to know. They don't want that. The white people saying we don't want our kids to feel bad. Well, you don't want them to feel bad, but you want our kids to go to prison, get shot by police. But you don't want your kids to feel, oh no, we didn't do that. How do you how do you figure that? How do you sit there and make determination 
on things that we have to live through year after year, day after day, week after week, century after century, decades and all that. But if somebody says something that make a white person feel bad, it's wrong. You did it. And that's a part of the indoctrination with the institutions that we're living in. Yeah. It's always the double standard. Yeah. But our kids are still dying. And they dying at an early age. Let me see where in history that happened before. Let me see. Let me take a minute. Hmm. <laughs> well, let's go back to when Jesus Christ was told about Jesus Christ coming into the world. And Pharaoh <laughs> said, go kill all the newborns. Welcome to history repeatedly mm -hmm. in a different time and a different space. It's still going on. Thousands mm -hmm. of years, you know, and, right. and, and, and but we to blame for it. They blaming us. But we was already here, partner. As Malcolm X said, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, Rock landed, landed on, on us. us. Because you came here, we was already here. That's why he made that statement. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what that statement means. We didn't land, we was already here. You landed here and we fed you. And then you turn around and say that we was we were we was cannibals. We ate we ate you. How you gonna eat somebody that's skin and bone? <laughs> I'm walking around here with chicken, chicken, turkeys, uh, every type of animal, and I gotta eat you. What? <laughs> we got a, we got crabs. We got the Justin Bieber baby. We got crabs. We got lobster. But we wanted a skinny European. That's, that's a different type them. of meat. And we want to show meat. <laughs> they tell you anything because it's easy to tell somebody something that don't read. That's why yeah. I didn't did, did, if you didn't have a book, hey, I guess it's true. And 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 see, that's that's uh part of the issue with the trans translation of the Bible because the Bible is a good book. It's basic instructions before leaving earth. But, you know, it's a book. It's a, it's a transcript of life as it was during the time when it was written. And even though people lived a certain way during the time of the Bible, there's mm -hmm. nothing new under the sun. The same things are happening then that happen now. The only right. thing that changed is the technology. Yeah. And it's with those people in the Bible, they were everyday people. Right. Everyday people. They did extraordinary things and that's the that's the problem they don't want to teach things because all the translation wind up being that it was built by africans or people of color mm -hmm. you know the great wall of china black people but when you you listen to them they'll tell you the chinese built it because we don't know no better mm -hmm. you know the united states Y'all didn't do nothing. Y'all were lazy. What? For 400 years? Ain't no way in the world we could be lazy. Right. And, and, and the Ku Klux Klan wasn't doing slavery. The Ku Klux Klan started after slavery for the simple reason they didn't know what to do. They didn't do any work. Right. right. So they did. They, they created the, the, the Klan to scare black people so they can keep them on the plantations. Right. Now, the thing of it is the robes came into place after slavery because the ideology has always been in place just like it is now. Right. You know, it's all up and through various systems and institutions, you know. Uh, the robe is no longer present, but when you go into the court system, when you go into the hospital, when you go into the school system, there are members of clans, uh, members of the clan present. Right. And... And when you go, and when black people go in the in, in, in the courtrooms, they have what they call the black book. Yes. They go uh -huh. in that. They go in that book, and that's how you get. That's how we get sentenced. Right. And, and, and going and, back, going back to the crack uh, with Joe Biden, that was a part of it. The cocaine and the crack. That's right. how that law came about. Yeah. It's always different. Yeah. And speaking of different, I'm over here at the full of gray site and i'm going to turn the camera around okay so that we can see the family grave site 
of uh, James E. Fuller, Norfolk's uh -huh. first black councilman, Civil War quartermaster, and a very influential person during his life yeah. after the Civil War between the 1860s and all the way up until the end of his life, 1909. Now, this is the first grave site or the first tombstone, and we see that someone has come to pay homage okay. with a wreath. And then here's an updated tombstone of uh, James Fuller, James E. Fuller. Okay. And if you can see, because it's kind of dark here, I hope that I'm getting all well, we the visual see. content that needs to be seen. Uh -huh. You can see he is here with his wife. And oh, here's okay. another family member, Carrie Fuller, Carrie V. Fuller. Oh, goodness, this is, okay. And all the way to the back, here's another tombstone. And this one is pretty faded. And it looks like it says Zale Fuller. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn the camera back around now. And so that's pretty much the... Uh, that's pretty much what we came out here to see today. Okay. Uh, the Fuller Grave site, the Sergeant Carney Memorial. And tell them the location of that again for those that just chomped in. So th yes. if they want to visit. Yes. We're here at the West Point Cemetery, which is located off of Princess Anne Road in Norfolk, right in between Church Street and uh, Monticello Avenue. I don't have, let me see, I did get some material mm -hmm. from the office a little while ago. Hold on a second. Let me flip this phone around while I look for this. Okay. Okay. Where is it? Okay, let's see. All right, let's see. I mean, because with this information, that's to give, you know, parents things to do with their kids. And it'll be a good, you know, to take them out there and then they could do a re a book report or something to you know to keep them motivated to you know to stay in the house and learn to read and do do positive things instead of then get involved with you know with you know gang if you want to be a gang go, go get a gang of kids to go to the cemetery and see see what your ancestors done see what the people right. that uh that ha have lost their lives and given uh community service so that you can have the right to where you are today this stuff is not free right you know right. our people have give sacrifice a lot so that we can have a better life and the, and this generation today is tearing all that down right i mean there's a lot going on with gentrification and you know even though we're in a different space culturally and historically there's still you know things and a lot that has to be done for uh, the improvement overall improvement yeah. of our lives as, as people, as a body of people, as black people. Um, I have the address here. The official address is 238 East Princess Anne Road, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. Okay. Well, to the West Point Cemetery. Okay. And then tell them that event and when it's going to be and, you know, and also how they can support you. You got a website for, you know, the black calendar that, that you create with historical people on it? Yes. Uh, website, culturebyle.co, C-U-L-T-U-R-E-B-Y-L-E.co. You can visit the website and read additional information as it pertains to the content of Virginia's Black ancestral legacy and heritage. Uh, you may also visit uh, the Facebook platforms or the social media platforms, Facebook at Culture by LE, Instagram, Culture by LE, and YouTube, Culture by LE. Well, that's good. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm asking all people to share this link. I'll share it with people on your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Messenger, because the more information we get, the more information we can instill in the next generation. You yes. know, we, we, are, we are living our life because the people, I, I, you know, with me is, my phrase is, we live to that. We're not living to live because it's the expiration behind each day that we take. 
and we must do much better uh, for the next the next generation. These young people, you know, all you got to do is point them in the right direction. And if we train, the Bible said train them while they're young. You know, but if we don't give them the information and inspire them to want to learn more about their culture, all they know is right now TikTok, uh, mess, uh, tw uh, Instagram, all they're doing is dancing. You know, singing a rap song with negative words in it. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a variety of things happening, and yeah. people zoom in on what it is that captures their attention. And it's a time and a place for everything. Right. But when you have a saturation of a particular thing, then of course, that's going to lead to a particular influence. And that's the importance of, you know, Black culture, Black heritage, and things of that nature, and knowing Black history. Because when you know where you came from, you have a better direction of knowing where you're going. And right. when you have a direction of knowing where you're going, you can control the narrative. And that's another thing. A yeah. lot of times with art and imagery and things of that nature, the images about Black people that are seen are the negative images. Um, and, when, and with not only with Black people, but with any body, race, or group of people, if there's a certain image that's highly saturated whether it's good bad or indifferent when you see that type of person you're going to react based on what you know if you don't know a lot of people of uh asian or black ancestry and what you see of them you're going to be definitive or you're going to be acceptive or receptive to interact with them based on what you know if you don't yeah. know any of them personally so in taking charge and taking control of our narrative we're responsible for that. We're, yeah. we're partly responsible for the images that are projected out there about us. And even with that, when we hear content as it pertains to, you know, rap music, as, as we talked about before, mm -hmm. you know, it's important to listen to entail the content of the context. Right. You know, because just because someone may use vulgar language, it doesn't mean that it it's set aside for everybody right you right, know when right. you listen to a story when you pick up and read a story um let's say mary had a little lamb you mm -hmm. don't feel a certain way about all lambs right you know what and i'm saying especially when it's fleas with white as snow and everywhere that <laughs> mary went the lamb was sure to go <laughs> following her to school one day and this was against the rules it made the children laugh and play to see a lamb in school <laughs> But yes, and you know, part of Culture by LE is definitely getting the information out there about Black yeah. history. The focus is Virginia's Black ancestral legacy and heritage among Black history across the world. But when we dive into the contributions of Black Virginians that came before us, we see that their influence helped shape the world. When you look at somebody like James Lafayette, if there's right. no James Lafayette, there would be no United States of America. Right. He's a black man from New Kent County right here in Virginia. Okay. And so we need to know those things. We right. need to know those things so that we can have accurate representations of us, not uh -huh. the inaccurate representations, so that there can be an even balance. And that, yes. that that's why, you know, I always, you know, always try to get you to come on because you you know, I don't I like I tell people, I don't know everything. But I do know people that know some things. And yes. the more people, the more we get together, the more information that builds, that's the bridge that bridge the gap. Because if you know something, I know about music. I don't, I may not know all the history. I know about scripture because I do read. <laughs> I've been in church ever since, like I tell people, I was in my mother's womb. I'm 69 years old. I've been in church for 69 years. Mm. So okay. when you look, when you look at from the birth, when my mother, when I was pregnant in her womb, I was in church. Okay, know? well, then, that, oh, you were deep in the church because the church, the body is a temple and you hello. were in your mother's temple. And the thing of it is, church is not about a building. Church is within you. You could have church anywhere. Right. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, you were deep into the church. Yeah. So, you know, like. You know, like I tell people, the, the, the world is, as the gospel song, you don't mind me singing the first. 
<clears throat> me, 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 me. This world is not our home. We're only passing through. See, we are passing through this earth because right, our time because... is laid up in heaven. God keeps score in heaven. So when our young people thinking that there's no life, I'm just going to die. I don't know. It's not true. The vessel dies, but the spirit is going to live on. That's exactly what I was going to get to. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the big kicker because mm -hmm. religion binds people. Religion is not a spirit. Religion is not spiritual. We are spiritual beings and people find comfort in religion because for whatever reason, they like tradition. Right. So there's nothing wrong with tradition, but religion is what makes people religious. And when you add religious to religion, it, I'm trying it, to find a verse to say. Well, it's, it becomes what we do every day. What we are talking that's the religion when we sit down to the table and eat that's a religion mm -hmm. because we're doing it constantly it's a practice it's a practice it's a practice without without even thinking about it it's mm -hmm. a practice so mm -hmm. religion is when you hear a rap song and they're calling women bees and ages it becomes a religion we used to we're accustomed to hearing it that's mm -hmm. why the, the the main instrument in rap music is the drum wow because, because it's the it's heart it's our heart it's our yeah. heartbeat. The, heartbeat. the heartbeat when they yeah. go to war the heartbeat the heartbeat yes it gives yes. you the it gives you the strength it gives you the power you take the heartbeat for rap music you take the beat out of that drum out of beat, rap music you ain't they ain't doing nothing they can't move you play right. all those other instruments that's right. why you got the instant the, the strings is 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 where the black woman created blues with i mean she she created country it was a black oh, yeah. woman why uh -huh. because she was playing a guitar uh -huh. blues is piano because that's what that's what i mean guitar because of of the strings um rock and roll is piano because jerry lee lewis Little Richard, they play piano. Oh yeah. So Little Richard went ham on that piano. Hey. <laughs> you know, you ain't get too the fruit eye. Oh don't get me started. You know, hey. I'm a historian when it comes to music. They can't mess with me. I keep trying to tell people my radio station, WBDM Radio, plays a diff all gyros of music. Because mm -hmm. our coach is the one that created it. Oh, yeah. we, we created yeah. it. But through our creation, like everything else, people just take it and do what they want to do with it. You but know? why is it so easy to take it? Because we don't own copyrights. We just started learning how to copyright. Yeah. And, 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 you, and, see and, a lot, and you see a lot of artists now owning their masters. Ain't that something? They yeah. own their masters. Yeah, only a few. And, and it wasn't for Michael Jackson and Prince. That wouldn't have happened. And, and yeah. Ray Charles. Uh -huh. You know, I'll I, I, I think about coming over to CBS if I can get my masters, you know. You know I don't, well, no, well, you we, know, we, we ain't never did nothing uh, like that. Well, 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 you know, I guess I won't be coming. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of music royalties, another Virginia native, Ruth Brown, she of was course. an advocate for artists owning their royalties rights and things of that nature. Okay. And Atlantic Records became what it is because of Ruth Brown. They call it the house that Ruth built. And she right. was born right here in Portsmouth. Oh, yeah, I know. My brother, my, uh -huh. my, my hair, when I get the use to get the way, the, 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 the perm, <laughs> her brother, her brother did my hair. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. right on. Right, it was it called the house. It was called the House of Wessons, right on House. Wow. Street, you know. Oh my goodness! He passed See, away, is, and his other brother. Yeah. This is did. what happens when we get together and communicate because we nobody knows it all, but when we exchange information, yeah. we become empowered and we grow. Look yeah, at that! Yeah, just like Jean Jean Chandler. Who? Out of Norfolk, Jean Chandler. Okay. Name, he was from Norfolk. Okay. A lot of people, a lot of celebrities. Tell us the, about them. The, the, the uh, old opera house. Uh-huh. 
on the other side before they the, the, uh, uh, before they extend it to the opera house used to be the uh, uh, I forgot the name of it. That's where all the all the black shows used to come. They used to have two wow. shows on Fridays and Saturdays. Wow! Well, James Brown, Ruth, all those people came through here. The Chitlin Circuit was in Norfolk, right over there off Grammar Street. Oh yeah, I, I know about that. You know the Attic's Theater and all no, no, that no, no, stuff no, that was coming. No, you said the Opera House. Behind the Opera House, it was I forgot the name of Norfolk Arena. Norfolk Arena. Okay. That's where all the black shows used to come. Wow. J James Brown, uh, 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 everybody, Gladys Knight and the Pips, Marvin Gaye. Uh, everybody performed there. They used to have two shows because my mom used to go to the Lake Show. Okay. So when people don't know, <laughs> and then over in Portsmouth on, on, on High Street, they used to have this place called, the, I think it was the Teat Ballroom. It was an after-hour spot. The, the, okay. The, the Teat Ballroom, that's where all the black people like a, a private pri private place. Then you had Fagans on uh, Porsche Boulevard and Walker's Grill, you know, where they had liquor license back then, you mm. know. But that's why all the black people, you couldn't go in if you won't dress. You didn't have a, a, a sport coat and a shirt and tie. You didn't get in those. And Fagans was right there on Peace Street, right down from uh, Post, I forgot what Post is, uh, oh, you know, where all the uh, military, military posts, you know, it's a lot of historical paper. People just don't know. They, they, I keep trying to tell people. They keep all you hear about right now is Atlanta, the West Coast, the New York. Mm -hmm. All most of the celebrities came out of Virginia. That's why I keep trying to tell people when they sit around thinking that, uh, you know, Tim Timberland and Pharrell and Missy, they ain't the only ones. I mean, right. you got some, most of your historical people in entertainment came out of here. What's we call it? Frankie's Got It? Uh -huh. Frankie's Got It used to record black people. Some of wow. the most famous black people was recorded at, on Grammy Street. Frankie's Got It, man. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, so people people have to do their homework. You know, yes. They got a little a walk, a walk of fame over there down Grammy Street. They got bricks in the ground of of this of the uh, people that recorded music, you know, uh, uh, like the other guy, his dad, uh, uh, Lenny Guess. Lenny uh -huh. Guess had his own record label. Wow. With recorded people, wow. I know his son. His son, he writes plays and stuff. I haven't talked to him in in, in about a year now, but uh -huh. he writes plays. And he, he that his dad was Lenny Guess, one of the one of the biggest recording, you know. Recorded a lot of people here. Chester mm -hmm. Benton, right of WRAP, he had a, a, a group called Mass. Uh, over, at, I, 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 I think it might have been Mass Production, and Mass Production was from Norfolk State. Uh -huh. that's, yeah, that's recording artists. So all these people, we got historical people that's here, uh -huh. and Chester Benton is a captain in the military. Wow, in the, in the reserves. And his, hmm. and and his brother owns um, Stock and Leggings, the Black okay, History okay. Uh, uh, Clothing Store for Men. Uh huh. Uh huh. Down on Grammy Street. So all the stuff that people think they know, we have a legacy. But right. they didn't want what they did is when they came in with hip hop and the clothing to depreciate the black culture. Black people always dress. Right. Suits. Brothers had on suits. And then uh, you, when you talk to a young man, ain't, that's church clothes. I ain't put that on. Depreciate. Depreciate the culture. I guarantee most of these young men that's dying today are going to jail. Especially if they go to jail. When they go to court, they got to put on a suit. You ain't going in court if you ain't Ooh. dressed right. Go ahead if you want him. The judge will tell you. Next time you come, you better have a suit or something. Or dress Ooh. like a lady. Because I done been in court and I heard him tell him. So Ooh. when people don't understand this, we're not teaching. We're preaching. And the choir ain't listening. And that's a big difference. That's a whole big difference. Right. Because when you're preaching, you're talking to. Right. You're talking at. Right. When you're teaching, 
you're pouring in. Right. So that's what I, I what I do with, with the things I work on. I don't preach to anybody. I'm teaching you, go look mm -hmm. for it. What I tell you, go look for it. You know, <laughs> and that's another thing I'm, I'm going to be working on. I, I got I got a whole plan, but I don't tell people how I work. I'll send uh, proposals out or give you some information because all they want to do when they have meetings, when you go to these meetings with people, they're just trying to figure out what you're working on yeah. because they already got the bag. Uh-huh. And they'll tell you, well, it would be nice if we could, we could find some. But right now, we, we, our budget is stretched. And the next thing you know, what you said at that meeting, they're using it. And right. you ain't getting no pay for it. Right. I done, I done learned over my years of working, talking to people, and showing people things. Because what they take is your information. And that's why when you go to college, what do they do? They tell you, okay, get in a group. You know, I want a group of four to five people in this group. And y'all sit down there and work out a plan. And what happens? Y'all sitting there in a group, and somewhere along the way, somebody going to take your information. If it's a year later, two years in it, they got the plan, and you got a certificate, a diploma. Now you go and get a nine to five and try to figure out how you're going to pay back 50 or 100,000. You know, it, it's it's ridiculous how we have to do things without working together. We harm ourselves because we don't work together. That's why it's written in, 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 in that's why I said it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. But the child is today is raising the village because the village can't even go sit on the porch. Old people can't wow. sit on the porch. Old people can't be in a house going through a neighborhood, people breaking in, shooting in the, through shooting and getting shot in the house, kids getting killed in the park. But it's only in our community. Because they don't step across the street. There can be a whole community of white people across the street. They ain't gonna step foot over there and shoot in their house. Because they know all hell gonna break loose. And that's why when we don't teach and train our kids, they just wreck habit. Like I tell people all the time, what's the most easiest killing machine in our community? It is not the police. It is our own community. Because we're the only ones on the news. And what makes it so bad? The news media is making millions of dollars reporting that stuff. That's where most of their money is made. It happens. Yeah. It's a repetitive cycle. Right. It's a repetitive cycle. And right. until we and until we adapt our own jurisdiction for the way that we determine to live, we're always gonna end up in the same cycle. Right. We got smart kids out there. That's why I I'm, I talk the way I talk. There are smart kids. No they doubt. just need somebody to pay attention to them. Everybody needs guidance. We right. need guidance when we were coming up, and it's the responsibility of the elders to listen to the children. Just Thank because you. the children are young don't mean that they're incapable of learning because we were all young, and we all learn. Right. And children are sponges. They yeah. soak in the things that are in their environment. And so whatever it is that they see, they project. And we all have a choice. We all make the choice to either be like what we grew up in, we or either be a product of, of our environment. Right. You can and be a product we, of your environment, or you can step out and do something different. Yeah. And 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 everybody. And most of the time, people just want to be able to live and have fun. Like I keep telling people, black people don't hate white people. No, it's a system of oppression. It's the system of white supremacy. It's the, it's the white privilege. Right. It's the double standards. And as I've said before, everything vowed in this country goes back to slavery. Again, because black people still deal with the traumatic, with the traumatic uh, instances of slavery. Yeah. And that's all reflected in the school to prison pipeline. You take, for instance, every time a black person or black corporation or black people got together, there was mm -hmm. some type of infiltration 
during Reconstruction, black people were were doing things like 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 never before. You had black people in Congress, you had black people in legislative positions, but when the laws changed, it reverted everything back to where it was, Jim Crow. And then in the, in the early uh, 1900s, of course, we knew a black Wall Street. What happened with that? And then we had organizations like uh, the Panther organizations and organizations before the Panther Party. What right. happened with that? And so it's not that we're incapable, but we're always in an inward battle. And sometimes we're, we're forced to fight within ourselves because, you know, black people uh, are the ones in some cases that infiltrate the progress that's made because they've, they're given incentives, they're given money. Just like um, back in the day during the Revolutionary War with the manumission laws, it's mm -hmm. always been that way. You know, black people have always been forced to turn against each other because when you have something or when you have, when the opportunity is presented and the opportunity look better than what you got, some people gonna bounce on their opportunity not knowing what's best for them. And right. then at the end of the day, they get the bad, they get the, they get the bad end of the stick. And it's, and it's double. Yeah. It's double the pain and the atrocity of that shiny token and coin that looks so good that they, that they decide to bite because they think it's going to be a better life. Yeah. And so when you look at the system of slavery, white supremacy and all of that, yes, we have problems within our, within our neighborhood that we strive to fix. But we're always going to be up against a different type of system. Right. And until we can really get together and unify, I'm, what? That's where um, I'm at with it. Yeah, we have to continue. That's why we have to continue to strive to show young people that we care. If we show them that we care, sincerely, they will stop. Right. I know that because I got seven kids. I know that because I got almost 15 grandkids. So there's no such thing as they know that uh, each kid, they know that they, they are loved. I've worked with teenagers. I know what they do. I, that's why in nightclubs, I, I didn't run a nightclub. It was like my home. I made it like, hey, come in. You're welcome to be here. I'm, I'm glad you came. Like mm -hmm. I said, mentioned to you before, the, the police department saying that uh, Picasso's was treating Crips and blood like they was royalty. I don't know mm -hmm. Crip or blood. I just know there's a black right. man coming here looking to have a social event, meet some ladies, have a couple of drinks, get some food, and then call it a night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But because I said yes, sir, to them, I, always, I said yes, sir, to you. So why didn't that ring a bell? Why is I'm saying yes, sir, to you? Master, I didn't put master on the end, I guess. Yes, the boss. But if I said yes, sir, to a black man, I uh, thank you, ma'am. Appreciate that. Hope you come again. I had my staff doing that. Why not? They black people. I don't know no other way. I wasn't brought up to say, hey, uh, 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 you know, a mocha. If I call somebody by their name, my mom popped me in the mouth. Yeah, yeah, that's Mr. Bond or that's Mrs. Miss Miss mm -hmm. Jones, mm -hmm. Mr. John Jones. When you get to somebody else, you sit there and don't say nothing unless somebody asks you. Because right. if not, if you get this look, <laughs> you know you in trouble. Don't let the head go. <laughs> you already know what it is. And ain't you no words. Know. And ain't nobody saying sit down or screaming. You get the look. You know what the look mean. Uh oh. <laughs> when I get in the car, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> so when I get home, I'm they're gonna have to wake me up. <laughs> Try to get out from getting getting the whipping. Because there was you, you was taught respect, and the schools right. used to teach it. What people don't know is, when you went to school, you had to learn how to say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. You had mm -hmm. to learn to, to learn how to stand. You had to learn to, to, to learn how to dance. They taught mm -hmm. you dancing, square dancing, and all that. You and know, that's what we need those. now. We need those. We need what you're stating right now to be re-implemented. Because right. there's always been some type of influence to interrupt the structure, like right. in the 80s. Like in the 80s. I remember because I, I was a young lady in the 80s. I was mm. a bit past a toddler in the 80s. But right. yeah, I remember during that time, 
you know, the social workers, it was, um, you was told that, you know, if the parent is uh, going to beat the child, then, you know, the child could call 911 and then the child will end up, you know, in the care of the social worker. And right. they had some of the parents, some of the parents was like, shit, I don't give a damn, come get the kids. Hello. And then some parents was like, no, nah, I'm not, no, nah, uh-uh. And so that, that interjected in the structure and the way that families, uh, single parent families, right. uh, were raising their children. And because the children pretty much felt as though they had the upper hand when right. they got in school, that's when all of the um, that's when all of the other stuff started to happen. Yeah. So when they changed the rules, I saw it when I had my kids, and you know, why would you put a five year old on a bus to go to go to any kind of school? Five years old. I'm not. No, they're not going on no bus. My son is 22 years old. He's like, man, dad, I tell my friends, you won't let you won't let me walk to 7-Eleven. I said, okay, if you want to go to 7-Eleven, I'll take you. you know, and it's right across the street. It's only a block from the house. I ain't never let him walk to no, you know. Right, I ain't, right. I'm not trying to, because I know what I'm going to do. Uh -huh. If something happens, I, I, I ain't trying to hear nobody. I think since a kid tried to bully him one time, I told him, you call your mom. You need to call your mom. Uh -huh. told his mom, I said, your son, you know, snatched some tickets from my son. Well, my son said that, you know, the man gave them to him. Well, well, why, well, why would my son be, be upset or crying if the man gave him the tickets, gave you your daughter? He snatched them from my son. All he had to do is ask because he wasn't going anyway. Because I work mm -hmm. nights. I would have gave them to him. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. said, well, you know, I'm just letting you know because if, if something like that happens again, it's going to be a problem. You know, what the kind of problem is. I'm just letting you know. I hope it don't happen again. You know, I'm just, I, that's why I'm bringing it to your attention. Because the next time it happens, I'm getting a warrant for you and your son. I don't understand. <laughs> anybody can get a warrant out on anybody. I'm going to let the judge right. settle. Because when you lose a day from work and hit your pockets, that's why they give you tickets. The judge will let you go, but he tell you next time you come, bring your toothbrush. Don't come back. I'm gonna let you off with a warning. But it's now you now you're in the system. See, once you get mm -hmm. in the system, you never leave. That's, yeah, you're, you're that's, branded. The, that's the key point. You're branded. Yeah, you're branded. So somewhere along mm -hmm. the way, they know you're gonna be coming back. And they'll make up for that. Like I keep telling people, I'm the I've been arrested so many times, it ain't even funny. Mm -hmm. I only went to jail two times. Mm. Two times, the first time, because I told the judge I drove to court. He said, what? In Norfolk. I said, he said, you driving on suspended license? I said, no, my license is not suspended. I, I got them last week. They was reinstated at DMV. He said, shut up and sit down until I call you. Then he called me back up 10 minutes later and said, let me see those licenses. He saw that it was instated. He said, okay, but you were late for court. So what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna, that's 30 days. I'm going to suspend 30 days and I'm giving you two days in jail. And a fine. Why am I going to jail when I'm not driving on suspended license? Uh -huh. in, in, in Virginia Beach, they put me in jail. The judge asked a trick question. Said, how many times you ever been driving on suspended license? Uh -huh. I said, I've been driving since I was 17. I'm now 61 years old. I, I mean, I've been, I don't know the exact number. He said, you don't know the exact number? I said, no, sir. He said, but I do. So he started holding the thing up like this and rolling it off. He would have said, since you don't know, and I do, I find you guilty. I'm going to give you 30 days in jail. I'm going to suspend 26. You are going to be in jail for four days. See, by my, you know, my spirit tells me, well, why would they do that? So they're going to suspend 26, you in for four days. So what they're doing is they put you in jail, but they're going to charge the state or the city for 30 days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even though you didn't pay, you, you was in there for four days, but this, the city going to get paid for 30 days. Because you were found guilty. 
It's a racket. So when you're sitting there in jail, all you got to do is pay a fine. Because the last one, the detective told me, he said, yo, Cap, what are you doing down here? I said, I said, because this is just ask me how, how many tickets I had. So I was driving on suspended license. He said, the judge must have, had a, he, he must been in a bad mood. He said, yo, you don't, you don't need to be down here doing, going through this. And I said, okay, well, he said, you know, he said, he must be, he must been in a mighty bad mood for you to be down here. Because I, I, I got I to tell people I know police and I know detectives. You know, like, I know you, bro. I mean, you know, you're not a guy yeah. to be down here in jail. And, you know, you got to. I don't got, even know what to say about that. Yeah. So, like, you know, like I keep telling people, all policemen ain't bad. But you got to understand the police mentality. He wants to go home after eight hours. He don't mm -hmm. know who he walking up on. Uh -huh. And you moving and reaching for stuff. He's only reacting out of fear. And that's what I'm trying to tell people they don't understand is you are not getting shot because of the police officer. You're getting shot because he's a white man fearing for his life. And that, that's goes what he back, says. and that goes back to the projection of the images. Just right. like they have images of us, we have images of them. Right. And, you know, we shouldn't, I mean, we shouldn't have to have a separate conversation with our children for how they should respond and react when they're in the presence of the police. Right. You're supposed to keep your hands on the, put your hands on the steering wheel. Keep, put the light on inside the car so he can see your moves. If you're moving I mean, for something, before they get to me, I already got the license and registration in my hand. Ain't going to be no excuse. Uh -huh. You know, because I know you're stopping me for something. You ain't stopping to say, hey, do you need a cup of coffee or something? Now let's go get, some, go get some breakfast at Denny's. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I know when you stop me, I got to give you, have two things available. License uh -huh. and registration. I ain't making no sudden moves. You know. Right. If you want right. to, you know, something happened to me, they're like, yo, he ain't do that because he always hit it. He hit his license. The blood going to be on my license and, and, and on my registration card. <laughs> well, but it's, it, again, we have to, it, it's, it's all in like communication. And knowing the history and teaching our young people to love right. themselves. They don't love right. themselves. Right. And that's all we have to do. But I'm going to close this off now because I know you have places to go and I got a show to do at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. And it's getting close to that hour. And uh, yeah. I didn't. We get on live. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll get to talk. We could be on here till next, next week. Uh, but the thing is, is if, if to let people know about your events and your calendar, like I said, it's, it's important for us to support your cause, your effort, because it's, whether or not we want to hear it, it should be for the next generation. It should be mm -hmm. for the young people. You know, this is yes, what it's indeed. all about. You know, get the calendar. calendar. Yeah. And give your website again so they can purchase or, Website is culturebyle.co, C-U-L-T-U-R-E-B-Y-L-E.co. And I'm going to go back and plug in all the information after this live so that you can go ahead and assess it and tap into it and uh, be connected. Yes. Okay. Well, I've been on Facebook in a minute. It looks kind of nice, though. <laughs> yes, and I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity in this room. It's doing a number on me, so I'm going to get up off of this. But yeah. thank you always for the opportunity to come on because I enjoy talking to you and I enjoy learning what you share as well. It's always a reciprocative moment and that's much appreciated. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of history out there. I don't, I don't say I know it all, but what I try to do is share information for people to go back and research it. I, like I tell people, I don't know nothing. I'm just telling people what I've been through, you know. And, you know, maybe somewhere along the way, you'll run across something or somebody and they'll say the same thing. That's why it's called mm -hmm. connecting the dots. Yay! Thank you for bringing that information <laughs> about the historical place over there in Norfolk. Yes, indeed. I will, uh, before we leave, I'm mm -hmm. just going to get another image okay. of the monument. Sergeant William H. Carney, a member of the 54th Regiment. 
54th Massachusetts Regiment of right. Black Soldiers that fought in the Civil War. And the West Fort Monument is located, I believe it's 213 Princess Anne Road. I read the uh, address a short while ago and it's back in my pocketbook. But it's okay. on Princess Anne Road in between Church Street and uh, Monticello Avenue. All right yeah. then. And thank you again for taking your time out to do this. Thank you. And to bring this information to the uh, Best of the 757 Community Talk Show and to yes. the world, because this is worldwide. And uh, the, we have to keep pushing to get better results, uh, you know, with what we work with what we have to make it better for the next generation. Yes. And thanks to everybody for watching. I appreciate it. Yes. All right, then. It's, 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 it's making, yeah, it's making my face numb. But yes, until next time, and thank you always, Captain 85. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, then, you too. Well, that's right. it. Bye-bye. To all the people that was viewing, please don't forget to share this information with people on your uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Just make sure you share. Sharing is caring. To the next time we meet, to the next time we agree, remember to love yourself and put God first and everything else will fall in place. It doesn't matter what others think about you because you really, I don't care. <laughs> it's all in what you think about yourself. Join me at three o'clock on the best of the, uh, on WBDM radio. I'll be live from three until six. Until then, bye-bye.